Detroit. All right, our next speaker. You all know our next speaker. What do you say about our next speaker? John Lott. John Lott is the head of the founder of the Crime Prevention Research Center, not to mention just the absolute worst nightmare for anybody on the other side. And if you want proof of that, look at the Katie Couric movie and see how much, how much time they gave him. Four hours of interview? They couldn't, they looked at it and said, what do we do with this? We can't make him look bad. So Stephanie Schutag or whatever her name is, mispronounced intentionally, said, just cut it out. <laughs> Don't tell anybody we even talked to him. It'll never get out. <laughs> well, it got out. John Lott, New York Times bestselling author, More Guns, Less Crime, now in its third edition, and his new book, my favorite, The War on Guns, Mr. John Lott. Well, thanks very much for having me back. Uh, before I get started, I wanted to go and comment a little bit about what Rick Ector was saying. You know, here we have a situation where anybody who's read my work knows that there's basically two groups of people who benefit the most from owning guns. The people who are most likely to be victims of violent crime, and unfortunately that's one identifiable group. It's basically poor blacks who live in high crime urban areas. The other group that benefits the most are people who are relatively weaker physically, women and the elderly. And so Rick is basically doing a saint's work out there trying to make sure that the people who are the most vulnerable out there are able to go and defend themselves. You know, one thing I've kind of run into, uh, he mentions the anti-gun politicians in these urban areas, is how many times you run across Democrats who, when you look at their policies, they are actually disarming these particular groups of people. Uh, you know, after Washington, D.C.'s Heller decision, uh, they enacted new gun control laws that the Washington Post found cost $820 to go through the process to go and license and register a handgun in Washington, D.C. Who do you think they stopped from being able to go and own guns by having those types of rules? In, in Colorado, in 2013, when they were uh, passing their background checks on private transfers, uh, I got a call from some state legislators and uh, they asked me what amendment I would put up. And my suggestion was to put up an amendment that would exempt people below the poverty level from having to pay the new state tax on transferring guns. With the exception of two pro-gun Democrats, every other Democrat in the state house voted against that exemption. I mean, I could go on and I'd give a lot of examples in the war on guns on this, but how many taxes can you think of where Democrats will fight tooth and nail against exempting people below the poverty level from having to pay. You know, what's the cost of that? You know, again, it's the very type of people that he's fighting for to be able to go and protect themselves on their own who are the ones who are most harmed by this. Um, you know, the reason why I wrote the War on Guns this year is it's hard, I mean, we always tell ourselves that this election's the most important. But it's hard to think of another election, I would argue, that as much is at stake, just in terms of what is involved in terms of the Supreme Court. I mean, right now, you basically have a four to four tie with, uh, after Justice Scalia's death uh, earlier this year, in terms of justices who believe that there's an individual right for self-defense and those who don't. Whoever appoints Scalia's replacement is going to determine the outcome of that, and there's cases uh, that we've lost in places like California that look like they may be going to the Supreme Court, or whoever appoints them is going to decide whether or not the Heller decision is overturned or not. And the Heller decision couldn't have been a more basic or starting point that you could have had on this, because all the Heller decision did was say that the government could not completely go and ban guns. It had a complete ban on handguns. But it, even though you could technically own a rifle or a shotgun, for all practical purposes, you couldn't use it in self-defense because there was a five-year prison term just for pulling a bullet in the chamber of a rifle or putting a shotgun shell in a shotgun. And so the Supreme Court said that for all practical purposes, everybody, all citizens, were prevented from using any type of gun for self-defense in D.C. So if that's overturned, 
The only thing that's going to really change is that the government, again, is going to have the power to go and ban guns. Presumably places like D.C. will change. But you also have cases like California. For people who don't live in California, uh, one thing you need to realize is that since 2001, when they introduced some, quote, safety regulations on handguns, so basically the argument is you should be able to drop a handgun from the top of a tall building onto concrete and still have it function properly. Uh, there have been over 1,200 models of handguns that have been banned for sale in California. Only one new handgun model over that entire period of time that's been allowed. Probably in a few years, uh, all handguns will be effectively banned for sale in California. Well, if Hillary wins this election, then what you're going to have is a situation where my guess is the Supreme Court at that time would say it's okay to effectively ban handguns through safety regulations. If, the, if, if Trump wins and appoints people that he's talked about appointing to the Supreme Court, then my guess is that type of law will be struck down as not accomplishing its goal and also uh, effectively banning citizens in California from owning an entire class of guns. I mean, it's already very restrictive what they're allowed to go and own. Now, there's lots of issues I could go into uh, in the book uh, or talk about in the time that we have. The book goes through a range of different types of issues. Can I just ask a question? How many people have been at the last uh, gun rights policy conference? Okay, so about 20%, maybe less. Okay, I'm just trying to think what I should talk about here. So, um, um, you know, I've talked before about background checks. I won't go through as much as I've done previously, but there are a couple basic issues because right now from Nevada and Maine, uh, we have new initiatives on uh, background checks on private transfers. We see, obviously, the push at the national level, probably the one type of uh, law that uh, Hillary Clinton's been pushing has been background checks on private transfers. Surely after each of the mass public shootings that we've had, uh, President Obama, it's the one law that he's mentioned each time that we need to have. Now, of course, it would be nice if there was a reporter sometime who had asked, Mr. President, you say how important this law is after each of these mass public shootings. Can you point to one single mass public shooting that would have been stopped if this law had been in effect? Because he can't. Uh, not only during his presidency, but years before, there wouldn't have been one that was stopped. But there are a couple points to make here. One is something I was just talking about, and that is these background checks aren't costless. Uh, if you want to go and transfer a gun in Washington, D.C., it costs $125 to do it. Uh, in New York City, there's one shop, they'll do it for $125. Others will do it for more. And you look across the country, we're talking about non-trivial costs that are there. And again, who do they stop from buying guns? But it may not stop you or I from buying a gun, but basically poor minorities who live in high crime urban areas are the ones who will be stopped from owning a gun for protection. But it's much worse than that. I, I've mentioned to you before that there's 2.4, when Democrats will, or gun control advocates will say there have been 2.4 million dangerous, prohibited people that have been stopped from buying guns, how that's wrong, that virtually all of those, something over 99% of those are mistakes. But what I haven't told you about before is that who gets hit the most with those mistakes? Basically, it's minorities again. People tend to have names similar to others in their racial group. Hispanics have names similar to other Hispanics. Blacks have names similar to other blacks. 40% of Vietnamese in the United States have the same last name. And so <clears throat> what happens is, is that when you have, let's say, a criminal that you're trying to stop, and you have somebody who you're looking for just similar names and birthdays, you're going to create a lot of what we call false, false positives, a lot of mistakes that are there. 30% of black males in the United States are legally prohibited from owning guns because of past criminal history. Who are they most likely to have their names confused with? Other law-abiding black males. Now, there's no reason why the government should be making these mistakes. If a private company made mistakes like this at 100th the rate 
that the federal government does, the company would be sued out of existence under federal law. The reason why companies don't make these mistakes but the federal government does is the federal government simply doesn't use all the information that it has available. When you buy a gun and you fill out the 4473 there, you put down your name, put down your social security number, put down your address, put down your birth date. When a private company does a background check, they use all that information. Even though the government has that information, all they use is roughly similar names. So middle name could be completely different. Phonetic spelling for names uh, is all they're really looking for. I've never been able to get them pinned down exactly what they mean by phonetically similar spellings. And birth date. They don't use the social security number and they don't use the address. And so it's because it's so broad like that, they make a lot of mistakes. And again, I would argue that the mistakes that they make are basically racist. But there's no reason why they have to do that. It's something that they could easily fix if they just had the federal government have to meet the same types of standards that the federal government forces private companies to make when they do background checks. So there are lots of other issues I could get into on this. Another thing that uh, President Obama constantly raises when uh, he's talked about the mass public shootings is the claim that somehow these types of attacks are unique to the United States. You know, he says that these types of things just never happen in other countries. Sometimes he will refer to it as never happening in, uh, in developed countries. Any way you want to try to go and define it, that's simply false. Uh, what I try to go through in the book is list out each of the cases of mass public shootings using the FBI traditional definition of, of mass public shootings in Europe and the United States. You may not realize this, but in the European Union, over the first seven years of the Obama presidency, they had 25 mass public shootings. The United States, over that same period of time, also had 25 mass public shootings. You also have to do these things on a per capita rate. If you look at casualties per capita in the European Union during the first seven years of the Obama administration, you had uh, a casualty rate that was 50% higher per capita than what we had here in the United States. I'll just give you one country to look at. You look at France, for example. Just France last year had four mass public shootings. The total casualties from those four mass public shootings was 532. If you look over the entire first seven years of the Obama presidency, there were total casualties of 396. You had more casualties in one year in a country that had one-fifth the population that the United States has than you had, I see people taking notes, you don't need, it's all in the book, okay, <laughs> but it's, the, uh, um, you see more, you, you saw more casualties in one year in a country one-fifth the United States by 140 more than you had in the United States over seven years. I mean, it's not even close. But, you know, one thing I could talk about a tiny bit, well, before I get to that, well, you look at the media coverage. Last fall, I don't know if you remember this, there was this huge media sensation. Wall Street Journal had multiple stories on it. All the, all the uh, networks did about this study that claimed that even though know, the United States had less than 5% of the world population, we supposedly accounted for 31% of the mass public shootings around the world from 1966 through 2012. Anybody remember seeing the headlines? It was all over the place. Anyway. When the story started coming out at the end of last summer, I got a couple calls from reporters like at the Washington Post and what have you. And I said, well, I have a hard time believing that. I've done some work on my own. Could I see a copy of the study? So, oh, no, no. The author said that uh, only journalists could see this. He wasn't going to share it with researchers until later. And I tried to press on them at the time that that was kind of a strange request to make. It didn't really have any impact. And, uh, you know, I showed him my work. And I tried to tell him, look, you can't put much weight in something if people aren't going to tell you the cases or how they put them together. So anyway, and I contacted the author. The guy named Adam Langford. He's at the University of Alabama. And um, 
I'd asked him for a copy of the study. He said, no, he's not releasing it. until The paper finally came out in January. And I read it, and I said, I still don't know what's in it. And so I contacted him. I said, look, I can't figure out what your cases are. Could you give me a list of these mass public shootings? He says, no, I'm not going to share it with you. And I said, well, could you at least tell me how you collected these cases? Because you have to realize, trying to find cases of four more people killed, let's say, in Africa in the 1970s or the late 1960s, I'm not even sure how to go about finding something like that. And so uh, he said, no. I said, could you tell me what languages you looked at? Or at least some of the, because the thing is, for the United States, it's easy to find these things because we have databases for news stories. We have things, if you're any lawyers in here, you know Nexus and Westlaw that you can go and check these things on. He said, no. Nah. The only thing he could tell me was, quote, it took a lot of time. And I <laughs> said, well, you know, it'd be just nice if I could check these things because you don't even have the total number of cases by continent for me to be able to go and check this. Anyway, uh, um, I've gone back and looked at these. Now, the thing is, I've convinced myself, even for large cases, uh, you know, let's say 15 or more people killed, I know I'm missing cases around the world because I can guarantee you, South American countries that may have, or Central American countries that may have murder rates 80 times, or not, uh, you know, uh, 20 times higher than the United States rate, or in Africa that may be 20 times higher, they simply don't get news coverage on even some large shootings that I've discovered. And um, so, but if you look at mass public shootings in which 15 or more people are killed, what you find is that the United States is below the rest of the world in terms of mass public shootings. Uh, Africa has a, casualty, a, a death rate from mass public shootings from 1970 through March of this year that's about 480% higher than the United States. You have South America that has a rate that's going to be about 500% higher than the United States. You have other places around the world, even Europe, is 65% higher than the rate in the United States. About the only place around the world that has a lower rate is India and Pakistan, and it's only about 7% lower death rate from mass public shooting. You know, the thing is, when you look at this type of thing, I I'll just give you one example. Only by luck, I came across a police report for five years during the early 1990s from, uh, from the Solomon Islands. And uh, now the Solomon Islands are a, are an, a country that has 500,000 people. And they basically banned guns a couple years before this report was done. So, and one reason why I spend additional time looking at this is because the gun control advocates say, see, guns were banned in the Solomon Islands and no gun deaths occurred afterwards. Anyway, I just happened to come across this police report and there were three big mass public shootings in the five years after guns were banned there in the country. Now, the thing you have to understand is that when you have three big mass public shootings in a country of 500,000, the per capita rate is like off the charts there, it's even assuming that they didn't even have any other mass public shootings over the rest of the time. So what I tried to do is I contacted the Solomon Islands Police Department, and I said, look, I have it for these five years. Could you help me out? And they said, no, I'm not going to help you out. And, uh, and after a while, it dawned on me that the, they had like no desire to help me out because they figured, what's the worst, the best that's going to happen? We're going to have some guy who does research in the United States publish a study that talks about all the mass public shootings in the Solomon Islands. They want tourists to come there. They don't, you know, they can't think of any positive benefit. It's not like they have a Freedom of Information Act where I can go and uh, I tried to check into this, but there's no Freedom of Information Act request there to go and get the data. And the thing is, there are lots of parts of the world like this. Not only can't you find, it's not like the rest of the world was on the internet in 1966 or 1970, all right? And it's not like they have databases for that. So the numbers that I just gave you, showing that the United States is well below the average in the rest of the world, is an underestimate 
of the rest of the world and how bad they are because I know we're missing lots of cases, even when you confine yourself to cases where there are 15 or more. Now, I could go and talk about just mass public shootings for hours. I'll mention uh, uh, something else. Just this last week, we had a lot of news coverage on uh, polls that show, made the claim that uh, gun ownership in the United States has been falling. Here, here's the irony. Just uh, a few weeks earlier, I wrote a piece for Fox News where there had been a survey come out by Pew, which is hardly known as being a conservative group, uh, showing that over the previous three years, gun ownership in the United States had increased by seven percentage points. When they came out, there was like no news coverage on it at all, no mainstream news coverage on their poll number. But this other poll that showed that gun ownership had fallen to less than 30% in households got a lot of news coverage. And the thing is, you see this time after time. I tried talking to people at Fox and some other places. I said, look, most of the polls show no drop. There's some that show an increase. Why don't you provide some context, at least, when you go and you do this one survey? I mean, the rest of the media wasn't even worthwhile even contacting them about it. You know, Gallup in uh, 2012 had a survey that showed at that time record gun ownership. You can go back and do news searches on it. You will not find one national media outlet that gave any attention. I can't even find local mainstream media outlets that give it any attention. Why does the media do this? Why do they go and give attention to surveys that show drops in gun ownership but ignore ones where it's constant or it's increased? I think there's a simple reason for this. They want to make gun owners feel isolated, that they're somehow different, make them feel that others are getting rid of their guns. Maybe they should think of doing it too or at least not consider going and buying guns because they're somehow ostracized from the rest of society. And, uh, you know, it's unfortunate, but it just gives you an idea of uh, how monolithic, monolithic this is, even in what you would regard as kind of more neutral mainstream uh, media outlets. And I think it has a real impact on people's perceptions. Now, <clears throat> what, how much time do I have left? About seven minutes. Seven minutes. Um, well, I mean, I could go and talk about other things, but I'm happy to go and take questions from people uh, in the there's audience. A over there. yeah, there's a microphone over there if anybody wants to ask questions. Um, don't all rush. <laughs> the, uh, I don't know, maybe I should just take that as uh, people nope. want me to keep talking. Okay, going up there. Um, I got a question. Do you have any grasp on how much the existing background check system is costing us? Well, there are lots of ways it costs people, just in terms of time. Nobody has an estimate of that. You know, the thing is, even the nat annual reports that used to be released up through 2010, the Obama administration stopped releasing them. My, I have my theories for why they stopped releasing them. I, I, my guess is a lot of the numbers probably look worse than they used to in terms of the problems. But, um, uh, you know, to me, the big question is uh, the cost that it imposes in terms of the people who are obtaining guns and who, in particular, it prices out of being able to get it. And there's no reason why uh, we should essentially have this tax on people buying guns. If you're going to have uh, this cost, I would go and argue if you, if you really believe that background checks reduce violent crime, and I don't, and I have a lot of data in the war on guns that uh, responds to claims on this, what you should do is you should make people, you should pay for this out of general revenue rather than just a tax on, uh, on the person who's buying the gun. Dr. Lott, if I could intercede a quick question. Uh, earlier, AWR Hawkins, Right. Uh, gave, a, uh, gave a listing, a partial listing of all the mass casualty shootings over the last, oh, about seven or eight years and compared to the number that had a background check. It seems to me that the research might be worthwhile to find out what percentage of mass casualty shooters, say since 2000, have undergone a background check because that statistic, well, uh, in terms of the percentage that had uh, gotten a background check and then committed a mass casualty shooting, that statistic might be a very effective hammer for us. Well, I already did that. 
I mean, I've already, <clears throat> it's al already as a chap. Yes, I gotta buy the book. Right. So, <laughs> so uh, all, all, already in the book. So, uh, ba basically, uh, since 2000, there's not one of the mass public shootings that would have been stopped by having these background check laws on private transfers. So we understand that four hours worth of data dump was probably a little bit difficult for them to parse. If you could take one piece of information that you would have liked Katie Couric to be forced to contain, to have in her whatever it was that she put out, what would you have liked to see in the movie? What would you have right. liked to, of what you had told her to be in the movie? Well, <clears throat> oh, about four hours is a little bit misleading in the sense that they often, if you ever get interviewed on something like this, you'll find that they often tend to ask the same questions over and over again in order to hopefully get you to say it a little bit differently in a way that they think they can use at that point. I mean, Katie Kirk was not a friendly interviewer. But um, what I tried, if anybody who's watched the movie knows that one of the big things that they were trying to push are these background checks on private transfers. And so that's one of the things that came up many times. And my point to them was the same point I make in the book and made to you, and that is the current system is a mess. You can't, there's no justification you can have for a system where probably over 99% of the, these denials are mistakes, where it's law-abiding citizens who are being stopped simply because they have a name roughly similar to somebody that you want to stop. There's no justification for it. I've been bringing this up to gun control advocates for 15 years. They have like no desire to fix it. It's basically convinced me that they view this as a benefit from the system almost rather than a problem. And, and one thing I haven't mentioned before I'll just mention is the problem has gotten worse under Obama in, in multiple ways, but at least one way that we know for sure, and that is at least under past presidents, they would go and have people to check to see whether mistakes were made in most cases. Not in all, but at least after a year or a year and a half, you'd eventually get a letter in the mail that said, whoops, we made a mistake, we thought you were somebody else, uh, hopefully you can take this letter and be able to go and buy a gun. What's happened now is President Obama has removed all the people that did any checking. Nobody's doing the checking anymore, double checking. Now you can go and appeal, but most people are going to find it a daunting task and are going to find it necessary to go and hire lawyers. So not only are you having a system that goes and overstops minorities, blacks and Hispanics, but then middle income and poor people in that area who are falsely flagged are finding that they don't have the thousands of dollars to go and be able to get through the process to go and fix it. So what I was telling Katie Couric was pretty much what I just told you just now, and that is, I was talking about uh, the mess the system was making, how it was discriminating against poor people, the costs that were there, and saying, I also don't believe that it reduces crime, that if you do the research correctly and not the way Bloomberg does it or the way some of these public health people do, and the book goes through and explains the mistakes and helps you understand what the problems are with the way they do it, um, you know, we have a costly mess that's discriminatory and hurting and, dif and disarming the most vulnerable people in our society. Uh, yes, one more question. Uh, one, we've got, I'll tell you what, hold on just one second. We've got a question and answer session at 5.30, okay? So we're going to have to move with the doctors for responsible gun ownership. But, John, thank you very much. Sure. Maybe we'll start with you at the question and answer on the next one at 5.30, okay? Okay, well, we've got to keep moving on. Doctors for Responsible Gun Owners, you guys pop on up. John, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Excellent work. He's the greatest radio interview in the world. You ask him a question and he just answers and then.